And um, it's absolutely uh, a real honor to be with the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow. Um, I'm sorry that as for the reasons we all know um, that this isn't in person, but I hope um, I can do uh, your society justice at this online event. Um, I was really honored to receive this uh, invitation as Geraint mentioned, uh, the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 is coming to Glasgow in a matter of months now. Uh, so I hope you will find my theme of nature and climate and emergency response timely. So I'm going to start with a provocation and that provocation is that we humans are part of nature. We are not apart from it. And we need to tackle the nature and climate crises together or we tackle neither. Nature is in decline, it is in crisis. The climate emergency is imposing unprecedented change and is inextricably linked with the nature crisis. Humanity is courting disaster unless we can act on both and urgently. We need to get on the path of green growth so that nature is rich, diverse and plentiful as well as supporting us economically, socially and environmentally. That requires transformation, effort, sacrifice even. Global action is required, including in Scotland, as well as in other industrial countries. After all, Glasgow is the cradle of much industrialization across Europe, triggering human influences on climate. And Glasgow and Scotland can now lead us out of these twin crises particularly through COP26 later in the year. Now there's also a parallel COP happening in China just weeks before the Glasgow one. That's COP15 focused on nature. Together, these two COPs will deliver international agreements, which I hope will begin to reverse the startling trends in climate heating and nature degradation. Two reports published this year stand out as fundamentally game-changing reports that will frame the public policy debate and how we as individuals respond to the climate emergency and nature crisis. Some of you will have heard of the distinguished Cambridge University economist, Professor Partha Dasgupta. For those who haven't, earlier this year, Professor Dasgupta published an important and influential report which crystallized the vital dependence of our economy on nature. Professor Dasgupta's review of the economics of biodiversity flipped the tra traditional economic paradigm on its head. Instead of ecosystems being part of an economic system, Professor Dasgupta demonstrated that economies are embedded in nature, i.e. that people are a part of nature, not apart from it. For many, maybe too many, it was a light bulb moment. We need much higher rates of understanding across society of the link between climate and nature. This will drive changes in how we manage the land and sea to shift away from dependency on fossil fuels, monocultures and over exploitation. It will also drive much needed behavioural change. In addition, I'm sure you all saw the report from the International Panel on Climate Change on Monday. This prompted the UN Secretary General to issue a code red for humanity, warning global leaders that COP26 is last chance saloon for worldwide agreement on the need to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. It continues the general trend of their reports over the last 32 years of, it's worse than we thought, it's happening sooner than we thought, and we know it with more certainty than we did before. For the first time, the wording is unequivocal. So let me develop some evidence to support the provocation. I'm going to cover four topics. Why nature and people are one, the climate nature crisis, nature at the heart of a green recovery, and COP15 and COP26. But first, let me briefly introduce Nature Scott. As Grant said, Nature Scott is the lead public body advising government on all aspects of nature. We work to improve our natural environment in Scotland and inspire everyone to care about it. Our aim is that all nature in Scotland, our key habitats and landscapes, 
all our green space and our native species is maintained, enhanced, and brings us all benefits. It is the job of all of us to maintain a balance in the sensitive management of our natural world in order to maintain and enhance biodiversity. And in doing this, we work with a range of partners and put people and communities at the heart of what we do. Two of my favorite quotes touching on the sanctity of nature are from Crazy Horse, the 19th century Lakota war leader who fought encroachment by white American settlers on Native American territory. And James Lovelock, the environmentalist, futurist, and proposer of the Gaia hypothesis of earth functioning through self-regulation. In their different ways, as these quotes show, they reinforce the notion that humans are part of nature, not apart from it. That we need to be planet-centered, part of nature, not masters of it. During this talk, as well as thinking about the climate and nature crises, I would also like you to consider nature itself and our relationship with it. So how critical is this? We are in a state of climate emergency. Scotland was the first nation to declare this. This all too familiar graph shows the steady increase in global surface temperature since 1850, showing unequivocally that the observed trend of 1.1 degrees warming mainly results from human activity, primarily from burning fossil fuels. We all need to take action. But in addition to not burning fossil fuels, nature has an essential role in the transition to a net zero economy, both in terms of reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and in building resilience to the consequences of a changing climate. So let's look at the global trends in climate change and how these will continue under different scenarios. First, the top thick gray line is the projected climate heating until 2100 under a business as usual scenario. This has over four degrees warming just 80 years from now. Some have concluded that this will result in a largely uninhabitable earth. As we move down the graph, we can see that current policies get us to about three degrees warming, the blue lines, and major reductions in global emissions from 2020 onwards are needed to remain in the 1.5 to 2 degree range of the Paris Agreement. Those are the yellow and green lines. By major reductions in global emissions, I mean around 10% a year for developed countries from 2020 onwards. That would allow space for developing countries to grow and to establish some equity. The Paris Agreement was to limit global temperature rise to between one and a half and two degrees. Why is that so significant? Because our best understanding suggests that if global temperatures increase beyond this, the results will be catastrophic. Beyond this, further increases become more difficult to control and the consequences of heat waves, fires, droughts, floods, pest, disease, and perhaps more pandemics will render large parts of the planet uninhabitable. At COP26, countries will set out their contributions to net zero and the actions they will take to get us into that 1.5 to 2 degree Paris range. But make no mistake, even if we limit climate heating to 1.5 degrees, there will still be significant effect. Increased extreme weather events, wildfires, impacts on nature. Successfully limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is no cakewalk for humanity. And currently the combined efforts of all countries will not get us close to that. In Scotland, we've done well so far, but inevitably there is still more to do. Scotland was the first country to set binding emissions reduction targets. Our target date for net zero when we produce no more greenhouse gases than we remove, is enshrined in law as 2045, five years ahead of the rest of the UK. These are not arbitrary dates. They were recommended by the Climate Change Committee. The Scottish date is deliberately ahead of the date for the whole of the UK because of the makeup of Scotland's land and sea. Scotland's ability to store or sequester carbon is significant not least because of the amount of peatland across our lands, and I'll say more on that later. If Scotland misses its 2045 date, 
the UK as a whole is likely to miss its 2050 target. We've made significant progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This has largely been down to transition to renewables in the energy sector and other technological changes. This has been relatively, and I use that term advisedly, easy. Significantly harder challenges remain with heat, fleet and food. Harder because they are about who we are and how we project our success and identity. This challenges, what does it mean to lead a good life? The very heart of philosophy. Catastrophic is a strong word, but we are already seeing impacts and they're expected to increase in both frequency and severity. As well as the headline making increases in flooding, coastal erosion and wildfires, there are some less well-known but equally important changes arising from climate warming. These include the growing incidence of droughts, disease outbreaks, human suffering due to heat stroke and power outages. The image on the slide is a summary of research carried out by one of Nature Scott's fabulous graduate placements, Fairly Kirkpatrick Baird. On the incidence of drought in Scotland, you see her maps on the right hand side. The work shows that droughts will increase in both frequency, intensity and duration in the next 20 years. Turning to nature, the data supports the conclusion that we are in a crisis. The State of Nature report published in 2019 by Nature Scott and other conservation organisations showed that we have seen a reduction by 25% in the average abundance of species since the early 1990s, and by almost 15% in the average range of species recorded since the 1970s. So we may have been living the good life since the 1970s, but at what cost? Out of all of this, there are what I find some quite startling figures. Of the Earth's living weight of terrestrial vertebrates, 9% is us, humans and our livestock. With all the rest of terrestrial wildlife, all those herds of wildebeest and reindeer, everything squeezed into the remaining 5%. So what, you might say? Well, the so what is that not long ago, it was the reverse with wildlife dominating. My point is that the planet is seriously influenced by us and the headlines point to us overshooting what can be sustained for us and the rest of nature. Instead of being part of nature, being planet-centered, we became unruly and untrusted masters of it. We have, in effect, been running an ecologically Ponzi scheme, robbing nature and future generations to boost our incomes and profit in the short term. So we have a challenge. Boy, do we have a challenge. We need to bend the curve on nature's decline, first to halt it, and then to stage a recovery. An influential report by IPBES published in 2019 stated that the health of the Earth's ecosystems is declining faster than at any point in human history, with one million species at risk of extinction. And this graph published in the journal Nature last year sets out the challenge. It shows the loss of biodiversity over decades. The gray line shows ongoing decline, the one million species lost, if we continue our current rates of consumption and exploitation of the natural environment. The yellow line shows improvement if we increase our efforts to restore nature. That's good, the curve begins to bend, but it is still below previous levels of species abundance. The green line is really what we want to see. It takes us to a future where our nature is resilient and able to provide the benefits on which we all rely. This would be akin to the 1950s to 1970s, before the oil-based economy took off. You will see that this relies on more sustainable consumption and more sustainable production, perhaps challenging to our very notion of success, but a challenge we must address if we are to effect change. The Dasgupta review, which I referenced earlier, highlights that we are currently stretching the Earth's natural systems beyond sustainable limits. The natural environment has tended not to feature prominently in economic strategies. Nature's worth to society is not reflected in market prices. This leads to underinvestment in protecting nature. Many aspects of nature are mobile, 
invisible or silent. This means that the effects of many of our actions go unaccounted. And the benefits of nature are often invisible and silent too, meaning they're not recognized. Governments around the world are faced with an invidious scenario of markets paying people more to exploit nature than to protect it. Correcting that market failure is no easy job. However, nature is as important as physical, social and human capital in driving economic performance and continuing to protect, restore and enhance it will provide multiple benefits to society. So the case for urgent action is, I believe, clear. In Scotland, as for much of the rest of the world, as we emerge from the pandemic, we want a green recovery to build back better. In doing so, we face a triple challenge or perhaps a triple opportunity through green recovery to transition to a net zero economy with more sustainable land and sea use, with positive benefits to the state of nature. To adapt to climate change that is already happening, which will also require major changes in the use of land and sea, and improve the state of nature by tackling the main drivers of nature loss, which include climate change. All three have to be done over the same period of time, from now to 2045, and forevermore, and on the same areas of land and sea, and given the IPCC's code red for humanity this week, front loaded. And this is now all the more important because COVID-19 has exposed the most extraordinary vulnerabilities and inequalities in society. One tiny virus, evidently arising from fragmented ecosystems in China, has torpedoed our so-called business as usual way of life. So in addition to the climate emergency and the nature crisis, we need a green recovery to haul us out of the awful fall out of the pandemic. So our climate is heating, we're coming out of a global pandemic and nature is in decline. Clearly we need to bend the climate and nature curves. What is the solution? Of course, there is no one single answer. There is no silver bullet. I've already mentioned the positive shift to renewable energy, which has reduced Scotland's emissions significantly. Technological and engineering solutions will help us further. But nature, as well as being imperiled by the changing climate, can also be the solution to rising global temperatures. So-called nature-based solutions, which are less well known than technological solutions, but no less essential, need to enter mainstream thinking and public conversation. Nature-based solutions are cost-effective and are estimated to be capable of achieving approximately 30% of the emissions reductions needed for global net zero. Their transformative effect in the landscape are generally cheaper than engineered solutions, delivering multiple complementary benefits for society. So let's get into a bit of the detail to show what nature-based solutions can deliver. In a net zero economy, sources of emissions have to be balanced by removals or sinks, for example, in vegetation and soils. So how does this work? The slide shows amounts of carbon expressed as carbon dioxide equivalent in four key ecosystems in Scotland. Much carbon is already stored in the ground or trapped in sediments in the sea. It sounds obvious, but the best way to manage this carbon is to keep it there by not releasing it into the atmosphere or burning it. There is significant effort underway across Scotland to ensure that our natural carbon stores remain in place and increase. These stores include peatland, woodland, marine and coastal environments and uncultivated and cultivated soils. Storage can be considered to be long-term, for example, peatlands and marine sediments, which accrue very slowly, medium-term, for example, woodland, or short-term, for example, agricultural land, where changes in farming practices can change the carbon equation quickly. Soils are a bit of a Cinderella subject in both climate and conservation. It's time they got the attention they deserve. We literally can't live without them. When healthy, they lock up carbon and prevent emissions, but when unhealthy, they can actually emit carbon, as I'll discuss later. Changing how we manage our land and sea to increase how much carbon is held in vegetation, soils and seabeds is central to climate change mitigation. 
Richer and more diverse vegetation and soils are critical to enable nature to adapt to the warming climate. Richer nature can also help us adapt by reducing the warming in cities through the shade of trees and the absorption of heat by vegetation. Richer nature can protect our soils and coastlines. Richer nature can support enhanced food production. The benefits from maintaining and increasing these natural carbon stores go beyond the climate benefits, vital as they are. They include enhanced biodiversity, flood management, sustainable economic development, and improved health and well-being. Nature-based solutions really do deliver multiple benefits. So nature-based solutions are vital for addressing the climate nature crisis. About 50% of the effort will be by protecting and enhancing nature, with the other 50% from looking at the other ways we use land in farming, forestry and development. All land and sea everywhere can play a part, not just bits of it here and there. And those uses have to create the diversity needed for resilience to the effects of a changing climate, the triple challenge again. So let's move from the songs and theory to some practical examples. I'll give you three examples of nature-based solutions. I mentioned earlier that Scotland's net zero was five years ahead of the UK's as a whole because of its natural resources. A key driver of this is peat. 25% of Scotland is peatland. We have over 2.3 million hectares of blanket bog, which stores 7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Absolutely fantastic. Well, it would be, but currently 80% of this peatland is degraded and actually emitting carbon dioxide at the rate of seven to 10 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. This is around the equivalent of annual emissions from Longanet coal fired power station when it was operating, of about 20% of Scotland's annual emissions. So to meet our net zero challenge, we need to turn this around, stop our degraded peatland emitting carbon and turn it back into a natural carbon store. The Scottish government has set an incredibly ambitious target of restoring 250,000 hectares of peatland by 2030 and provided significant funding of 250 million pounds to do so. But we need to go further with restoration. As I mentioned, 80% of Scotland's 2.3 million hectares of blanket bog is degraded. A reasonable estimate is that allowing for difficult to reach sites and areas which are, frankly, too far gone, there is the potential to restore 1.3 million hectares of peatland. To achieve that, we need bold, new, innovative solutions and different sources of finance. The public purse cannot bear this alone. This is a subject which Nature Scott is investigating with some urgency. Along our coasts and at sea, an integrated approach is needed. Blue carbon is a tremendous carbon store, not far off the potential of peatland in the amount of carbon it can lock up. The key task is to keep it there. We must safeguard our carbon rich marine areas, as well as reducing pressure on marine habitats and species. Working with communities, we want to support sustainable fisheries to help keep the carbon where it needs to be and to support our diverse marine life. In our towns and cities, nature-based solutions offer highly effective ways to help communities adapt to the effects of a changing climate, whilst also delivering a wide range of co-benefits to health and well-being, the quality of life, biodiversity and, and providing a connection to nature. So let me turn now to the revival of nature and the term rewilding that is so in vogue at the moment. Here is a brilliant example of rewilding, or in other words, the revival of nature in Carrifran in the Scottish borders near Moffat. Led by a remarkable community, since 2007, the Wild Wood team has planted more than 700,000 trees with 75,000 planted by volunteers. It is brimming with nature, and one of the great successes of this work has been the effort that has gone into painstakingly recording progress. The images here show the state of the woodland in 2004 and 2020. The pictures speak for themselves. But what is rewilding and what is it not? 
A recent scientific paper published this year in Conservation Biology sets out principles for rewilding. I agree with many of these principles, particularly around a rich nature and allowing natural processes to run their course. For example, rewilding is the rebuilding of a natural ecosystem by restoring natural processes, says the paper. Rewilding involves a paradigm shift in the relationship between humans and nature. The ultimate goal of rewilding is to restore the functioning of native ecosystems containing the full range of species at all trophic levels. Absolutely. However, there are a couple of elements of the paper which I find more challenging, including reducing human control and pressures, and that rewilded ecosystems should, where possible, be self-sustaining, requiring no or minimum intervention management. So the reason I find this a bit challenging is that it is inevitable that people will interact with nature because we are part of it. Getting that part of rewilding right so it works for nature, climate and people is vital. Beavers are a classic example of an ecosystem engineer. They transform narrow channels into wide, wet, meandering watercourses with braided channels and ponds, fundamentally changing water flow, hydrology and water quality. They provide natural flood management for free. But as the report published by Nature Scott earlier this week showed, in some places they can be problematic and a human intervention is still required. So whilst beaver introduction has been a fantastic success story, and you might exam argue a fantastic example of rewilding, it cannot take place without people. This takes me to some of my own perspectives on rewilding. The underlying ideas of rewilding are about working with natural processes, minimum intervention and the creation, maintenance and restoration of habitats on a large scale. In Nature Scott, we focus primarily on working with people in nature to address the climate nature crisis. I believe that local communities have to be integral to any rewilding initiatives and their progression. For some people, rewilding places a spotlight on restoring large predators and species, which were once roaming Scotland's wild places. I feel this risks being a narrow perspective. We must formulate ideas based on the nature of the future. Arguably, the past is a foreign land. So you've heard that we face twin crises, that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated all of this, that a green recovery is needed to address the systemic underlying issues of nature and climate, as well as building back better from the devastating effects of the pandemic. Where will the future take us? Next year, the Scottish Government, supported by Nature Scott, will publish an ambitious new strategy for biodiversity. This builds on Scotland's environment strategy, which set out as a vision for 2045, by restoring nature and ending Scotland's contribution to climate change, our country is transformed for the better, helping secure the well-being of our people and planet for generations to come. One of the strategy's six outcomes relate, relates directly to nature. Scotland's nature is protected and restored with flourishing biodiversity and clean and healthy air, water, seas and soils. Our new biodiversity strategy due in 2022 will meet the targets agreed at COP15, but won't be limited by them. International targets by themselves are unlikely to be sufficient to meet Scotland's ambition. So finally, returning to my provocation, the idea that we are part of nature, not apart from it, should not be provocative at all. But perhaps for too many it is, even if unconsciously so. How often do we link our behaviour to the impact that it is having? How clear is our understanding of that impact? Our decisions, whether in public service, in business or in private, need to be framed by understanding the long and short term impacts on our planet. After all, we only have one and we are consuming its resources at an ever faster rate. So let me offer six sentiments, and in doing so, let me make a plea that we seize the moment to revive nature for us and the planet. 
Nature is not just a nice to have. It is fundamental to human life. Nature will only be prosperous if it is sustainable in the widest possible sense. Sustainable land and sea use supports increased biodiversity and people's well-being. We can't achieve net zero without nature. Actions to improve nature will almost always have a beneficial climate effect, but the reverse isn't necessarily true. Nature and climate are intrinsically linked, tackle both together or tackle neither. And maybe the central challenge is to rewild ourselves, to see us as a part of nature. And this brings me to what you, as the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow, can do as part of this journey. Having received your Royal Charter almost exactly 120 years ago, on the 23rd of August 1901, you have grown into a great society which encourages discourse. It would be marvellous if, as we enter the final months leading to COP26 here, you raise a roof on the entwined climate nature crisis. The world's eyes are on Scotland, on Glasgow, and as history has shown, Glasgow is never shy of making its indelible mark on the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca, for that very stimulating talk and for setting out the task ahead of us and uh, also the call to arms for the society. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break now, an opportunity for the audience to enter questions uh, for the Q&A session that follows. So you should find a Q&A tab that you can use. And so if you want to click onto that, enter your questions there, and then we'll go through those. In the meantime, if you're new to the society or maybe you're a guest and haven't joined us before or just want to learn more about us, then you can always have a look at our website, which is royalphil.org. We'll put links to that in the chat in a moment. Uh, or if you want to join the society or um, give any donations or so on. But we'll take a five minute break for now and a chance for you to enter your questions. Thank you. OK, Francesca, if you're ready, then we can uh, begin the Q&A. Yeah, I'm still here, haven't run away. That's great, excellent. Uh, we've, got, we've got a range of questions coming in on uh, different topics. Uh, so I'll start with uh, well, the first question that came in. Uh, humanity tends to become a more human activity, human influence on the environment. What do you make of this? So in the IPCC report, there wasn't much to distinguish emissions from individuals, which of course vary between the global north and the global south and the emissions from, say, petrochemical industries. It strikes the questioner as a particularly Western viewpoint to elide difference in race, class, gender, location, etc. in this way, whenever many indigenous activists have been on the front line of the climate crisis for decades. Yeah, I mean, really good question. Um, and I think the IPCC report um, kind of recognises um, in the fact that 195 nations signed up to it, um, that you know, there is work to do across developing and developed nations. Um, and that is exactly what COP26 is there for, for all nations to confirm their nationally declared contributions and to um, set out their plans to achieve the, the Paris Agreement or indeed, you know, um, let, let's be hopeful, even better. Um, it does enable um, national and regional variations. And I think one of the really interesting issues that I've been looking at recently is the role of indigenous communities in supporting and conserving nature. Um, and I think looking at that, um, but recognizing the, um, the fact that economically developed nations have benefited from, frankly, exploiting carbon fuels up to now means that we have to build in a degree of equity and fairness in relation to the NDCs, NDCs that will be um, discussed at COP26. And um, I'm sure, um, as the, the question is alluding to, that's going to be a key point within the negotiations is how you balance the different contributions of different countries to emissions reductions. 
Okay, thank you. And on a uh, well, related question, uh, aren't our emission reductions also the result of exporting emissions through imports of manufactured goods from China and other countries? So are we really going to net zero if we're continuing uh, as we are? Yeah, I mean, I mean, to be to be blunt, yes, you know that and that, you know, the exporting of emissions, exporting of um, carbon is a real challenge. And I think you know one of the points I mentioned in the talk was about sustainable consumption and production, and you know, challenging ourselves um, to think about you know different. Um, models for ourselves of consumption and production. How do we amend our behaviour? Um, should we have a system of carbon taxation, which you know would mean that our imports would be more expensive? I don't know the answers to these questions that I'm just throwing out there, but um, what I am recognising is that you know, as again, as I said in the talk, there's no easy answer here, and it does require us all to fundamentally think about um, our individual um, behaviour, our organisation's behaviour, and obviously governments are thinking about um, their, you know, a nation's behaviour and, and policies so that we can um, reduce our emissions, get to net zero, address um, the, the nature crisis, but hopefully as well, and um, this is one area that I think the Scottish government is really strong on, is moved to a well-being economy. Um, so the kind of notion that we're, we're always measured by stuff um, maybe is beginning to recede. Um, again, that's more perhaps a, a question than an answer, but that's where I'd see some of the, the challenges um, coming through in the discussions at COP26. Okay, so um, I mean, you mentioned the idea of sacrifice there and uh, you know, carbon taxes potentially. We also said that we're a part of nature, not apart from it. So we've got a question uh, again on conflict, but how can we balance the standards of living of billions of humans versus wildlife and the Earth's natural systems? Yeah, and I mean, again, a, a great question. And, and I think you know, that comes to my sort of fundamental point is that um, we only achieve that balance if we recognise that we're part of a, an ecosystem um, we're not, we don't sit separate from it. We're not masters of, of nature, as I said, but we are integrated um, with it. And that is not just um, for a point in time, it's actually over time. Um, so, you know, our natural environment is, is a huge asset um, and we've been depleting that asset and what we need to see more of, I think, is recognising um, our environment as something that needs to be nurtured and invested in like any other um, asset. Again, you know, me saying that doesn't make it, it easier to do, but what I have seen um, in the last few years is a growing recognition of, you know, natural car capital in um, economists' um, uh, speak um, the Das Gupta report, which really I think challenges some of the traditional um, notions of um, um, economics as well as I was taught it um, many, many years ago. And so that recognition and being able to recognize nature for what it delivers is what's going to help address that balance. Okay, on, on the Descupta report, uh, there's no earlier TEB report on the economics of the environment and biodiversity. Why do you think that failed to build awareness of the need to work with nature? And can the Descupta review be more successful? Um, so I don't know why the previous one didn't land. Um, I would say two, two points in favour of the, the Descupta review. Um, one, this was led by the Treasury. Um, and actually, I thought when they announced the review, that was fascinating in itself, that the Treasury um, was saying, right, we need to think about um, how biodiversity and economics are intertwined. And in the same vein, we've heard um, Mark Carney, um, former governor of the Bank of England, talk about the importance of um, climate uh, risk featuring on, on balance sheets. So 
there's that kind of government led and not just um, you know a small department in government, but the treasury leading that I think gives it clout. I think the other factor is is timing. You know, it is of a time. This is a moment um, that you know um, we all need to seize, and I think the currency of these issues and how we address them is much more prominent than the previous report and that's that will help the Dascopter review land and indeed events like this where we're talking about it and giving it prominence can can only help as well. So I'm still on the policy side and the government, how do we achieve the kind of holistic systems-based approach that's required to get recognition of the multiple benefits of for example greening or urban spaces, incorporating active travel infrastructure with associated benefits for health and well-being, and to, therefore the associated co uh, reduced cost for the health service, reduced heat island effects, encouragement by diversity. Why won't politicians and economists, economists recognise this? Um, well, I think they're beginning to, actually, and um, you know, one of the areas of work that um, Nature Scott's involved in is um, a, a, a programme called the Green Infrastructure Fund, where we've administered, I think, over five years, around £35 million worth of funding to support green infrastructure to develop um, you know, and deliver some of the benefits that you've mentioned. And I think essentially what the, the question uh, uh, or what the question's getting at, and um, apologies to the question if it, this is a, an, an, a wrong interpretation, but is the need to move to a, you know, invest to save type model and actually investing in nature um, and, you know, nature based solutions, which, as I said, um, are often, you know, cheaper and provide more, uh, provide wider benefits than um, engineered solutions is an invest to save, whether it's flood defences, whether it's green roofs. We've got a fabulous example of a project we're supporting in Edinburgh, whether it's active travel. Um, all of that, I think, is now beginning um, to, to filter through. And we're beginning, I think, importantly, in terms of politicians and economic uh, economists recognising this um, we're beginning to get good data and being able to say, actually, you know, um, these are the benefits measured, um, you know, it financially, if, if needed, uh, to convince um, decision makers. Um, I think another fundamental kind of shift occurred with the um, advisory group on economic recovery that the Scottish government set up. Um, last year to advise on recovery coming out of the pandemic. And a really strong theme in that was natural capital. Um, so again, I think this notion that um, A, nature needs to be nurtured and nature can help us um, both with recovery and with economic growth um, is really beginning to take hold. Take hold. You touched on engineered solutions there, and sometimes uh, reducing carbon emissions runs counter to nature conservation. For, uh, for instance, uh, dams and water extraction associated with hydropower schemes are damaging to river biodiversity. So how do we balance these conflicting demands? Yeah, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? And one of my, um, one of my kind of closing six sentiments was that, you know, there are mostly, um, and I've not been able to, to, to find an example where this isn't true, um, but you know, maybe the audience will find one. Um, if you improve nature, if you invest in nature, there will generally be a, a climate payoff. Um, the converse isn't necessarily true. And some of the um, uh, examples that were given in the question of, yeah, kind of construction of engineered solutions um, to combat climate change um, might, you know, kind of have a negative impact on, on nature. How do you balance that? Um, so, you know, um, I would come back to um, looking first at nature-based solutions. So um, interestingly, I was involved in a, in a piece of work with the Institute of Chartered Engineers. And again, that was about educating 
um, the you know engineering community on the need to think glo you know broadly about solutions, not just the you know maybe slightly traditional. Um, do I say I'm not an engineer? Um, engineered solutions, but think broadly. So there's an education piece. There's also I think the need to you know, think about how we weigh up different benefits, but also different costs. When is the kind of flooding imperative greater than a nature imperative? Again, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's something that we maybe need to think about and develop the tools to do so. Okay, there's a couple of questions on uh, the nature of the nature, if you like. Uh, so, so Kate's asking, we talk about the importance of nature as part of the climate solution. How do we get the right nature in the first place? And uh, someone else asked, uh, you mentioned enhancing nature. What does enhancing the state of nature entail? To pick one example, we know there are concerns about inadvertently reducing biodiversity by planting trees which were never part of the native ecology of a place. In what ways does enhancing ensure that these kind of issues are avoided? And is there an inherent risk that enhancing nature simply replicates existing models of catalyst growth? Uh, catalyst growth? Yeah, um, again, really interesting topics. And, um, you know, can I just say, I don't know if if all of the um, attendees are members of the, the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow, but boy, they, um, they're certainly keeping me on my toes tonight. So you've got a great membership base. Um, yeah, kind of, you know, right nature, right place. Um, and I think I would, you know, my central response to that would be about diversity. Um, and indeed the very word biodiversity gives you the clue to the fact that, you know, resilient nature um, requires diversity, whether it's diversity in, you know, planting, avoiding monocultures, whether it's diversity um, in woodland planting. So um, yes, you know, a lot of the work that we do in conjunction with Scottish forestry is about balancing, you know, some of the, um, you know, really ambitious planting targets with the need for a diversity of species um, and ensuring that we have native and broadleaf species. I think the other point I would just make on, um, you know, enhancing nature, enriching nature, um, and, you know, fundamentally making nature better, you know, how do you, how do you measure that? Um, it's not as easy um, as with climate change. We've got a very defined metric there, haven't we? We've got, you know, global warming as measured by um, the Earth's temperature in degrees um, Celsius. So we don't have the same for, for nature. Uh, we can measure species abundance in different places, we can me measure um, populations, but what I find useful is to think about, well, what's challenging nature and the it best report, which I mentioned in the talk, talked about five really strong drivers of um, nature loss, which are um, the, you know, kind of unsustainable use of land and seas, um, direct exploitation of species, pollution, um, invasive non-native species and climate change, which um, kind of exacerbates the impact of the other four. So actually enhancing and enriching nature for me is part, you know, is about addressing all of those challenges. And if we can do that, if we can reduce our invasive species, if we can reduce um, pollution, if we can um, move to more sustainable land and seas, then nature will be enhanced, but I would come back to the diversity point and, and the person who was asking the question about woodland planting, absolutely, the diversity there is really important. Okay, I think you've maybe just preempted the next question, one from Babs here, but um, she's asking very specifically, you mentioned the forest in the borders, hopefully it will be a mixed woodland of native trees rather than monoculture of spruce seen so frequently. Yes. Excellent, nice, nice concise answer there. Uh, she also asks, can you please give a bit more detail on how badgers improve the environment? I can see they'll be uh, responsible for new species coming into the area, but there could be a huge conflict with humans' use of the land. And I thought it would increase flooding already a problem since we're building housing floodplains. I think maybe that's beavers rather than badgers. Mm -hmm. But uh, so uh, 
the conflict with humans, uh, how is how is that to be managed, or can you can you explain how they do improve environments? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think that probably is is beavers, and I'll answer it as as if it is beavers, but. Um, if it's badgers, then the, the question, please get back in touch. So what beavers do is they, you know, they create dams um, by, as you know, um, uh, kind of chopping down trees. I mean, they're kind of absolutely amazing what they do. Somebody did tell me the figure for the number of trees. This is from um, North America that the average beaver um, was able to um, excavate um in a year and it was i mean it was phenomenal um and so they create these dams which effectively turn kind of channels into wetland and what that does you know in terms of flooding is if you can imagine um uh you know a, a hard sided um stream um if the volume of water is too much it spills over the side and you get immediate flooding whereas by the creation of wetlands you get a more diffuse um pattern of water retention which generally um acts as um you know a way of preventing flooding of course there are some or preventing you know kind of damaging flooding there are some areas and particularly on prime agricultural land where doing that kind of risks crops although it disperses the water it probably disperses the water in a way that is really unhelpful um to farmers and that that's some of the conflictual situation that we have seen, particularly um, in Tayside. And um, we work with landowners on different mitigation schemes. Um, so, you know, blocking up dams to prevent that damage, um, looking at, you know, different ways to maybe encourage beavers um, to move to different areas. Um, we do um, look at translocation, which means, um, um, moving beavers to a different area and um, at the moment and um, the policy is that we will move beavers but only within the the range that they're currently established um, and you know in certain circumstances um, we do um, you know allow the the lethal control of an animal and that's a kind of absolutely a measure of of last resort um, all of this is really um, important to be done in consultation and engagement with with landowners and with the local community which is what we do and in that way back to the the conflict question that I think the questioner was um, posing we try and reduce that conflict and as I said you know key tenet of what I'm saying is that nature and people have to coexist together so part of our role is deconflicting any conflict that exists Okay, it's a slight change of subject. We've had a, a few questions on Pete. Uh, the first one from Robin, uh, can you explain more about Pete? I didn't fully understand why some of it was degraded. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, in terms of the um, uh, uh, degradation of peat, a lot of it comes from historical land use. So um, for example, one of um, you know, a great um, um, expanse of peat is at the Flanders Moss National Nature Reserve, which we um, manage um, It's near Stirling. I'll just give a little plug for that. Um, it's a really nice place to visit and walk. Um, and when we kind of took over um, that um, area of land, what had happened is previous land management practices had um, essentially Dry, drained the peat and dry, you know, dried it out um, to support, you know, generally agricultural grazing or, you know, just um, that was the, the landowner's kind of desire at the time. So that's why it becomes um, degraded. It effectively dries out and much of the restoration work is to um, re-wet it to ensure that, you know, kind of artificially inserted drains that are draining the water and therefore, you know, not um, helping with the carbon sequestration um, are kind of removed, um, you know, to remove any um, excessive planting that has been, you know, again, gone against the sort of natural formation of the peat and by re-wetting 
um, and returning, you know, a bog to a bog, um, that um, that is the, the restoration effort. Okay, and related to that, what's the biggest challenge that Nature Scott faces in working with landowners who have peat, who have drained peat? Um, so I think most landowners that we work with really want to do the right thing. Um, and that, you know, you know, we work through a sort of network of, um, you know, a network of, of landowners and, you know, more and more everybody's getting it. So some of the challenges are, you know, what is it going to mean for me? Is it expensive? I mean, we obviously provide grants and we support um, landowners financially for peatland restoration, but, you know, it's still disruption the landowner has to put in you know a bit of effort to get the the grant we help them but there's you know there's that cost um is it going to kind of change the nature of the the land in a way um that you know is is going to be difficult for them in the future um so you know i suppose you know what does that boil down to Shifting attitudes, maybe, um, making the process easy and, you know, yeah, kind of thinking about the financial incentive. Okay, and why hasn't Scotland banned peat in garden compost? Um, so that is a commitment, I think, in the SNP manifesto. There has been a commitment from the Programme for Government to ban um, domestic peat extraction. Um, I think that was in the programme for government 2018, but you're testing me. And I think the SNP um, manifesto gave that commitment. Um, I think, you know, yes, absolutely. Kind of, you know, regulate at point of sale um, back to, to choices, um, you know, as individual consumers and gardeners, we can make choices in terms of um, buying non peat uh, free compost. Okay, also on extraction, um, should, should Scotland stop extracting oil from the North Sea even before it's exhausted? And how can we justify the development of the Cambo oil field 75 miles off the west of Shetland Islands? Yeah, again, one of these um, um, real, I suppose, issues in terms of, you know, how we make the transition. Um, so you know, I think you know, if if people have been tracking what um, Scottish government ministers have been saying about the move to net zero, one of the really strong um, themes that I think has come across is the need for a just transition. Um, that you know we know moving to net zero, both in terms of personal choices, but in terms of um, industry, is 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 not going to be easy. And it needs to be a transition. And I think um, uh, one of the either Mary, I think it was Mary McCallan, um, was quoted as saying, you know, she didn't want um, Scotland to suffer the same kind of industrial type shock um, as has suffered in the past in a move to a just transition. So we do need to, I think, in a sense, we need to move along the curve we can't just jump down the curve in terms of um fossil fuel use yeah i also you know some of these decisions in terms of um yeah oil exploration oil extraction fossil fuel use they come from a consenting process which happened you know years and years ago and that's not meant to sound like an excuse i think it's a, just a reality of the process is that we will need to take time to, you know, work some of this through. Um, again, I think, you know, because of the current context, because, um, you know, industries are waking up to the fact that actually they need to change. Hopefully we can speed some of that up, but we do need to ensure that as we move to net zero, we're not leaving communities and different industries behind. And still on the energy transition, Andy asks, what's your view of the promotion of biofuels and biomass as sustainable energy sources, given the negative impacts involved? Um, so this is going to be really terrible. Um, it depends, um, answers. So, um, 
some can be, you know, some can be beneficial. I think, you know, back to um, some of the points that I said earlier, I think you need to consider some of this in the round of carbon nitrogen cycles. We need to think about how, um, you know, biofuels and biomass, um, you know, are used and ensure that removal technologies, if I can call it that, don't result in, in monocultures for carbon saving. You know, so back to the, the diversity um, and, you know, back to my soil is a Cinderella subject point again, you know, I think we would want to exercise, you know, a little bit of care in terms of thinking about how um, these technologies um, impacted on, on soil health. And also on soil and uh, cycles, do we need to move to a different form of agriculture and land management to one that's less energy intensive in order to restore habitats on the uplands and lowlands? Um, yes, and I think we are actually. And um, one of the, the pieces of work that, um, uh, that Nature Scott is involved in has been working with different farmer led groups set up by the, the Scottish government um, to think about that transition um, to net zero. Again, it has to be a transition. Um, so we can't go, I think, overnight from you know, a kind of set of, of farming practices to a completely new set. You know, these are individuals' livelihoods and, you know, we do need to eat. But actually, again, um, when you talk to, to farmers, as I have, um, and I'm sure many, you know, many of your members have, um, it, they want to do the right thing for nature and for climate. And so a lot of the work that we've been involved in is thinking about how we do that, how we incentivize that, we um, administer a scheme, a scheme called the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme, which um, supports um, you know, kind of farming for nature, if you like. Um, we know that there's great work done by the Nature um, Friendly Farming Network, uh, so I think, you know, again, um, as we transition both to net zero, but also um, out of the, the, the EU in terms of the cap system, then we've got a real opportunity to think about how we manage our land in a different way and reward, you know, public goods, um, i.e., you know, caring for nature appropriately and value nature um, by our land land managers. Okay, uh, well, in fact, D Doug has asked uh, something very related to that. Um, England's gone down this public money for public goods approach to replacing agricultural cap schemes. Do you have any encouraging news that Scotland might follow that lead? Um, I'm encouraged um, by the, the positive conversations that I have with farmers, crofters and um, their, their representative bodies. Um, I know that, you know, the comparisons are made with what's happening um, in England. And what I would observe is that in Scotland, we're very good at taking a very broad view and making sure that we're considering um, all the different aspects um, of uh, you know of a particular issue in this case you know uh, land management so the conversations that I have with the Scottish government with farms and crofters I think we you know we've all got our eye on the on the same prize and it's worth taking a bit of time to make sure that we come up with the, the most appropriate um, um, appropriate, you know, response and future compensation scheme. Okay. Um, given the crisis we're in, is it a luxury to be spending money on cons conserving individual species? Shouldn't all nature Scots be money spent improving habitats so as to sequester carbon? Conserving individual species can resume once we save the world. Uh, maybe a provocative question there. Yeah, um, so I haven't got the graph which would, or the pie chart, which would show you kind of, you know, how we, how Nature Scott 
spends its money. Um, but actually, a lot of our direct, um, yeah, direct work is on habitat, whether it's looking at the condition of protected areas and trying to improve them, whether it's working with landowners and land managers, you know, as I said previously, um, to um, move to a more sustainable land and indeed sea management regime. Um, I think the point about species is, you know, is interesting, isn't it? And I think it's going to become more interesting as the, the climate um, changes. Um, we actually, you know, there are some headline species um, which are iconic, which, yes, were involved um, in supporting, you know, beaver I've mentioned, wildcat is another, um, and they're, you know, beaver, great success story in terms of reintroduction since 2009. Wildcat, more challenging in terms of conserving that genetic purity. Um, I think in terms of, again, back to the, the diversity point, um, we make some really finely judged decisions on how to, to you know, spread our resources, which are, are relatively um, limited um, into to different projects. It's also worth noting that often our, you know, Nature Scott's contribution in terms of that type of work financially can be relatively small, but what we can gain um, in terms of our small contribution is leverage from other funds, whether um, it's, you know, Heritage, uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund, whether it's EU funding or whatever replaces it. Um, whether it's funding from, you know, private foundations and trusts. So actually our investment can, you know, reap significant uh, rewards in terms of levering other funders to, to support, you know, whatever the project is. Okay. You mentioned uh, a number of species there. Um, Joanna thinks the elephant in the room, so to speak, is deer as high browsing pressures impact on plans to establish new woodlands and trampling damages peatland further. Or prevent restoration. So, will if, or when will deer management in Scotland be recognised as a key barrier to habitat restoration? She asks. Yeah, I, I mean, um, uh, I think it it has been. So the um, the report of the um, deer working group, which the Scottish government um, commissioned, uh, was published in. Uh, in March and what that recommended affected, I mean, there were 98 or 99, 99, I think, um, recommendations of the DEA working group. And, but effectively that um, added up um, to a more assertive um, uh, DEA management approach, recognizing um, the issues that, you know, the, the questioner uh, has put forward and we will you know we're working with the Scottish government on how we implement the recommendations of that review which would mean that we'd move into a bit more of a um uh, potentially a bit more of a, a muscular regulatory approach as well as and I come back to working with um our key partners so Scottish Forestry, Forestry and Land Scotland um and a whole range of deer management groups so um and for those um in, in, the, in the call that don't know, um, in the Highlands, it's divided into um, effectively a, a series of um, areas which are kind of uh, are managed in terms of deer and all the landowners uh, in that area will come together in a deer management group to um, agree deer management targets. And that's a voluntary approach, but actually over the years, it's um, you know, it has uh, delivered significantly in terms of um, deer management, and we will continue to work with deer management groups, the Association of Deer Management Groups, and others to, um, yeah, to to um, do exactly what the the questioner said, because we need to manage deer. They're iconic species. They're also um, an economic. Um, you know, they provide income to many estates, so we have to recognise that too, but getting the balance so that we can ensure that particularly our woodland biodiversity flourishes is really important. 
I think we've probably got time for just a, a few more questions, uh, if, you, if you don't mind. Uh, two uh, on funding. Um, Jeff asks, a number of countries are adopting remunicipalisation re initiatives in which privatised industries such as water are taken into collective community ownership. Do you think such an approach, approach is necessary and would be advocated in Scotland? And James asks whether the Green Infrastructure Fund is closed to new applicants, and if so, when or if it will be opened again? Sorry, I just muted myself while I was pouring my noisy water. Um, um, I'll take the green infrastructure one first. You might have to remind me on remunicipalisation, if I can even say it. Um, on the green infrastructure fund, um, yes, um, because it is a an, an EU fund, and we are looking at how we, or it was an EU fund. We are looking at how. Um, we replace that because, as I said earlier, I think green infrastructure, um, you know, it is a nature based solution. It is incredibly powerful um, within our towns and cities. Um, so, um, you know, by all means, if the questioner wants to get in touch after this meeting, if they've got a particular project they're thinking of, we can look at how we can um, support that because um, certainly we. Um, want to, um, yeah, we want to continue our support for green infrastructure. Um, on municipalisation, um, is it a good idea? I don't know if I know enough about it to, to be able to judge. I don't know, Grant, can you just maybe recap that one a little bit? Yeah, so taking privatised industries such as water, and obviously water in Scotland isn't privatised, but it is in England, but where we've got other in other industries that have been uh, privatised uh, is bringing these back into community ownership, maybe not necessarily nationalised, but community ownership. Is that something that should be advocated? I mean, mm. so you could think maybe for an energy companies, for example, could owned by councils or local communities. Yeah, in, I mean, that's that's really interesting. It's not something I've, I've given a lot of thought to, actually. Um, what I would say is that um, we do work with a number of communities in terms of land asset transfers and indeed some of our own land um, we have transferred to um, community groups and you know for the, the, the because of the, the reasons um, that the question has set out and actually again you know and kind of repeating a, a theme here getting the community involved in the management of, of land um, or the management of a, a small hydro scheme, which you know is another example from Nature Scott, actually is really powerful because the community is, is making the, the choices um, based on its, its needs and wants, not um, you know, the, the needs and wants of a uh, an, an or, you know a fairly large organization. So yeah, I'm sure there is potential for that but I I would need to know a bit more about the model but certainly community asset transfer is something that Nature Scott has has um, yeah has supported in the past. Yeah. There's a question here on uh, there's been a bit of controversy lately about uh, grouse shooting uh, and it being damaging to both biodiversity and the climate. Do you have any uh, any views on this? Yeah so the Werity report was another um, report commissioned by the, the Scottish Government on grouse mirror management and um, you know a little bit like the um, deer working group that I mentioned um, it came up with a, a series of um, recommendations um, that effectively move us to a kind of more muscular um, approach um, on, on you know licensing of, of grouse moors um, to you know for, to, to manage them more effectively um, I think in terms of you know is grouse shooting damaging to to nature and to the climate you know again sort of slightly rubbish it depends question it depends how it's done it depends on the actual land management um, techniques that are being used on the grouse moor but we do need to, you know, and again, back to land management generally, need to weigh up 
um, the benefits, both in terms of the, the carbon cycle as, as well as nature. And I think what the Werity report has done is really just, um, yeah, kind of set us on a, on a path of thinking more fundamentally about that in terms of grouse mowers. And if I just combine a couple of questions into the final question, uh, I'm 25, not me, there's the question is 25. Are you confident that we will see the worst of the ecological crisis in my lifetime? And uh, Sam asks, fortunately, we're in a position to get our house in order by 2045. What responsibility do we have to support those places which don't have the resource to achieve these targets? Yeah, so um, will we see a solution to the kind of climate nature crisis in the, the lifetime of a, a 25 year old? By the way, Grant, you, you definitely look 25. Um, I, I hope so. You know, I'm. I hope so. Um, uh, so the the target that has been set for for net zero, um, as I said, is is twenty forty five in terms of ecological restoration. Certainly within Nature Scott, we're thinking of you know that and the interim target on climate change is twenty thirty. So we're thinking about. Um, targets um, in terms of um, you know addressing the nature issues for, for 2030 and the curves that I showed which I'm you know not technologically um, adept enough to be able to bring them back up on the screen but you know we do need to be bending those curves within the lifetime of a current 25 year old and actually um, I suppose a message that I'd want to leave is despite some of the um, you know, some of the alarming reports that I mentioned, you know, despite Code Red for Humanity, despite the at best report in 2019 um, on the state of nature globally and a million extinctions, all of these reports actually have a message of hope. Um, and all of them say, if we act, we can turn this around. It is not a hopeless situation. Uh, and I think we really need to, to hang on to that. Um, and I'm encouraged, certainly, you know, I've been the last couple of days at an induction event virtually uh, for Nature Scott and the kind of passion of new entrants coming into the organisation. And I think the movement um, in terms of young people to address these issues is phenomenal. Um, so, you know, there's another message of, of hope um, for us. Um, Getting our house in order and supporting other um, places which are perhaps not as fortunate um, of us. Um, yes, of course we should. And you know, knowledge transfer, for example, how we share our expertise and skills um, is a really key part of that. Um, how you know, you know, back to the negotiation piece, then I think that has to be recognized is that you know, developed nations. Um, you know, have have a responsibility to lead here, but also to support those um, that are not able to um, address these issues as as readily as you know countries um, and nations like Scotland. Um, so I think we we absolutely should um, help um, those uh, you know through through different means to do so. Thank you very much. We've still got other questions, but I, I think we've held you long enough. Um, thank you so much for, again, a very stimulating talk today and also a message that's very positive and one that can instill hope that, yes, we can do something to solve both the climate emergency and the nature emergency. Uh, you've covered a wide range of questions from a large number of people. Um, I'm, I'm sure they could keep you here all night, but uh, thank you so much. It's been, you've been a fabulous speaker and it's been really great to learn about the work that you've been doing with Nature Scott and uh, across, across that range of work that you've been doing. Right, no, thank you very much and, and thanks to everybody um, for, for coming along. And I, I've really enjoyed it, the questions um, which um, um, we will have captured somewhere has certainly been really thought provoking and that's a, a great thing for a, a Wednesday evening, even if it's sitting in my, my little room at home rather than kind of in a live audience. So uh, thank you very much to um, you and the Society for the invite. 
Thank you. For anyone, uh, for you as well, Francesca, uh, anyone who would like to join our next lecture on the 1st of September, Baroness Young, the chair of the Woodland Trust, will be talking on the topic, bestriding the world stage like a colossus or doomed, we're all doomed. So we'll get Baroness Young's view of whether she has such hope as well. Thank you all for joining us and wish you a very good evening. Goodbye.